off we go. Welcome to everyone. Welcome everyone to this week's CNCF live webinar, Pawning the CI Workflow and How to Prevent It. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand over to Stephen Jaguer and Barack Shoster with Palo Alto Networks. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen, the chat box. Please feel free to drop your questions there, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct, and please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under on online programs. They're also available via your registration link you used today, and the recording will be on our online programs YouTube playlist later today. With that, I will hand it over to Stephen and Barack to kick off today's presentation. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Libby. Uh, yeah, welcome. Welcome one and all. Uh, thank you to the CNCF for hosting this webinar. This is amazing. This is Poning the CI, the GitHub Action Edition, and with the idea that we'll eventually maybe do a GitLab or a Circle CI, and we'll do a few different versions as we as our research progresses, let's say. Uh, I am Steve Jaguer. Uh, this is, this is oh, I don't know, I just realized this. I've done this talk, and I have my boss as my co-speaker, so I am a complete idiot in terms of setting up myself up for high-pressure situations. Um, <laughs> I think that you'll be amazing, Steve. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we'll do the, the obligatory intros. Uh, if you've never seen me do anything like this before, I'm a developer advocate uh, at Bridge Crew, Bridge Crew uh, by Prisma Cloud at Palo Alto Networks. Uh, I've been writing code since 1990 mm -hmm. and uh, did a lot of quality automation, worked in, in security since 2014 for a bunch of different companies. If you find yourself in London, I run a meetup called DevSecOps London Gathering. Come join in. And I have a cloud native security Twitch show. And if you want to know more about that, and you love and you you want to take a risk, that's my LinkedIn via that QR code. Uh, Barack, I will let you introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm a friend of Steve. I like working with him. Uh, Co-founder and CTO of Bridgewood that was acquired a year ago by Palo Alto Networks. I love to drink wine. Uh, so if you have any recommendations and you want to deliver some, I'll give you. Uh, my address on direct messages, um, and uh, I love Star Wars. Um, so, if you love, if you have spoilers for the next movie, don't share them over DM. <laughs> yes, in, in, in spite of founding a, a company based entirely on Star Trek. Excellent. All right, uh, let's let's a quick whip through on the agenda. We're our CI today. I already mentioned is going to be GitHub Actions. We're going to go through some attack vectors, and we're going to actually do some of the attack vectors as well, which is the exciting live bit that's going to go completely wrong, probably, but you'll be here to see it. So uh, we'll talk about the threats, the different positions, and then of course, we, some of the attack vectors we're gonna go through, command injection, um, insecure image reference. We're not doing that one, but we're gonna talk about it. And create a reverse channel on a runner, hopefully we own that. Um, um, and maybe even cover our tracks, which would be pretty cool. Next slide, Steve. Mm -hmm. You good? There we go. Is my video going weird? A little. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm in, but I should probably also caveat that I'm in a hotel room, so internet may fluctuate. Uh, so I'm going to turn my video off uh, just to make sure that I, I minimize the disruption for now. Um, setting the scene a little bit, I, I want to talk about a little bit about the OWASP Top 10, because in 2021, the new OWASP Top 10 came out, and there were some kind of significant uh, differences. The ones that we're talking about today is that misconfigurations and insecure design issues came up at, well, kind of with a bullet at, at four and five. And that's really what we're talking about today. The move to cloud native 
has meant that some of the more traditional AppSec issues like infant sanitization, et cetera, have been replaced by misconfigurations and supply chain risks, which is which is fascinating. And that's where we're that's really where we're going to focus heavily throughout this talk. All right. This could be uh, teaching you how to suck eggs, I believe is the uh, the term they use in, in England. Um, but just to explain what GitHub Actions are, just in case you're completely new to the entire situation, uh, GitHub Actions is a, a continuous integration and or, and or continuous delivery system that allows you to automate your build, test, and deployment pipeline. Most people think a few years ago, GitHub was just where you put your code, and now you can actually take action on that code via GitHub Actions, which is cool. Uh, trigger off an event, and then your runners can execute different steps and make things happen, and we'll see some of that shortly. This is a cut and paste from GitHub's documentation, and it's intentional because of the way they give examples of what, we, what you can do with GitHub Actions, and that is the workflows that make things happen are in a specific directory called .github slash workflows, and the examples that they get give are perhaps, you know, hypothetical, one workflow to build and test your pull requests, another to deploy your application, and another interesting one that says you can add a workflow to add a label every time somebody opens a new issue, which is fascinating. So we're going to do a little bit of that and uh, maybe abuse that as an example. Uh, this is what a workflow looks like. So you can see we've got on push, and on that push, we're going to run a few very simple steps. So that's a crash course and GitHub Actions, but you'll certainly go knee deep by the end of this in terms of what it is we're going to do. Now, the fundamental problems associated with GitHub Actions, and this is maybe something that we would say isn't necessarily a design issue, but it's more a case of security awareness that you need to know. And I'm gonna just make them all appear. GitHub can and often will run a new workflow that you create in the GitHub workflows path, even if that's the file you committed, which seems probably seems kind of weird. So if I if I create a new commit and it happens to be a workflow file that's in that directory, and you can't it will run that workflow as if it, the workflow was already there, which is like seems like a bit of a paradox and is something that we're going to play with and we're going to um, let's say create some abuse cases for today. Uh, the second one that we're going to look at is metadata like the name of an issue, for example, or the description are often are available to workflows, like the like an issue grooming one that we're going to in, add today. And often people, there are a lot of examples out there where people are using those inputs for a variety of different ways without actually checking to make sure that something malicious hasn't been used in place of the name. So unsanitized input, which actually is kind of a traditional AppSec issue. Uh, and the, the last one, actually, Barack, you added this one, so I'm going to let you go for the last one. Yeah, let's say that you have a code repository. You grant access for all of your engineering team to write new code into that repository. But do you want the same level of access to your workload files, to your deployment pipeline, to your CI pipeline, being a, giving the capability to decide what tests to run or to not run, to any engineer and not centralize this level of access to a few individuals. Um, so you cannot have a different set of access controls on workflow files, which is a limitation on, on the different Git providers. Excellent. OK, so we're going to break down some of the attack vectors we mentioned earlier. And I'm using as the headlines kind of the suggestions that that were in the GitHub documentation. I do a lot of cutting and pasting from GitHub documentation in this presentation. So the idea that a workflow that adds a label every time someone opens a new issue, if there's something that they're doing with the title of the issue and they're doing it in the wrong way, and we'll look at examples, there might be a way that we can execute a command injection attack on there. The example where we're adding a workflow to build and test pull requests, well, we can potentially push a new workflow that does some of the things that we want to be able to do. An example we've got here is I could push a workflow that actually runs an, a command to the GitHub API that will auto approve my own commit, my own PR, which is weird, right? But it is possible, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the power of the built-in GitHub token that is associated with workflows. And of course, finally, if you're deploying your application, well, 
we can push a new workflow that might exfiltrate some of the environment variables or some of the GitHub secrets that are that are available to that particular workflow. And in a worst case scenario, say if it was a self-hosted runner that is running, you could potentially even run a workflow that would create a reverse shell to a command and control center, central, and you would actually be logged into the runner. And if that self-hosted runner happens to be doing, happens, happens to be in someone's environment, you there's a lot of potential dangers there. Actually, I, I, I'm gonna hand over to you, sorry, Barack. Like the dan the dangers of me logging into your self self hosted runner. <laughs> uh, so, um, in a self hosted runner, you have access to all of the VPC that the runner is within it, assuming that it's not least privileged. So you'll have access potentially to a database that is there, to secrets that are accessible through IAM access. You also have access to all of the environment variables, connection strings for databases, even if they are meant to be used in tests secrets and more cpu horsepower so um, you can harvest the resources of that machine or use that to create another attack or learn what else they're out there in my own vpc network excellent so it's dangerous essentially and that is what we are going to try and do today uh, the attacker context is there really, there's the idea of an external attack and GitHub has a lot of settings around there to try and prevent external people just being able to push code really easily. Um, however, it's not exactly like in great big, bold, scary alarm bells ringing kind of um, bold, let's say. For example, if I commit something, in order for me to, in order for workflows to actually execute and I've never committed to the repo ever, ever before, there will be this approve and run. So you have to look at it and say, okay, you know, I, I, do I want to push the approve and run to run my workflows? And I guess it's psychologically, you might be thinking, well, my workflows run all sorts of security checks. And so of course I want them to run. That would be silly for me not to. And I may not realize, and you can see the upward arrow there, that if the commit is a workflow, I'm allowing that workflow to run by clicking that button, which is kind of, it, it can be easily done. Um, yeah, the it's, most, sorry, go ahead. it's similar to having this. Do you do you give your consent for cookies? You click yes. Are you approving the next Windows update? Yes. Are you approving running this uh, workflow? You hit yes, and it will lead to someone utilizing your workers of your CI system for potentially bad actions. It, yeah, because we're humans and we love to click buttons. <laughs> it's automatic. And so the idea of becoming a malicious insider is, is what we're going to kind of play out a little bit today. Uh, there's a lot of things that say if you're a first time contributor, and you can see there's different security settings down there in, the, in this image from the, the GitHub uh, settings. So you can require approvals for first time contributors who are new to GitHub. So that's probably the lowest security. The default is the middle one, approval for first time contributors and then all outside co uh, collaborators. With the default, it's actually pretty easy to become a first time contributor. You can just make a change to a readme file or do something quite innocuous, quite simple. So, and then suddenly you, you're past some of these initial limitations in terms of what you can and can't do. So it's not all that, doesn't require all that much real like social engineering to make that happen. So here's kind of a real world story. Um, and I'm gonna let Barack do this because he's the one that showed it to me, it's hilarious. Uh, yeah, so we had uh, an external contributor, uh, Mayong34, uh, trying to contribute code to our own open source project named Chekhov. Um, and he probably have done it through the web console of GitHub and created a small file change to one of the files and update to our build YAML to one of our workflow definition files. Let's see how it looks like. Well, our original file on the left side has the whole build pipeline. Um, it has secret scanning, it has unit test, it has uh, static analysis test, it has infrastructure as code configuration test, a bunch of a lot of testing to make sure that the code we are delivering is doing what it should from the business logic reliable, test, tested, and secure. And it's running on a self-hosted runner 
on our own VPC, on our own segregated environment. But the contributor have tried to get into the self-hosted runner and see what processes are running in the PS command and print all of the environment variables, included, including secrets. If I have GitHub token, he would have gained access to do GitHub operations. If I had AWS access keys, it gained access to my AWS access keys where my self-hosted runners are actually running. Um, luckily, we had some controls to prevent that from happening, but he made a request to do that change and it was not running. But if I would have the default uh, configuration or a bad configuration, and I would have hit a proven run, uh, this contributor would have actually have um, our set, set of environment variables printed into the console. And that's what we're going to do today, but we're not going to be so diligent. We're going to let it happen. <laughs> okay, so hack number one we're going to do uh, is leveraging issue grooming. Um, I'm going to set a little scene. This is, these are some of the things that when I went to look at GitHub, and you can just search on github.event.issue.title. And I'm not going to do it live because I don't, on the grounds that it may incriminate the people via the results of the search. But this is just one example where I saw somebody adding the title without checking what it was and generating web pages from it um, for the website. And so that with the and some of the documentation was saying, well, this is so you could see how well they're burning down issues. Of course, the reality is that if I see that I can actually probably create a title of a of a issue that actually has functional HTML in it that would potentially present a login form that say, oh, you've just been logged out of GitHub. Uh, please log in again and send those credentials off to my malicious site. So a very dangerous way to, to just blindly use metadata that's been provided without thinking about how, how, how you should do it. And it's interesting because it's actually quite difficult to even try to sanitize that content. So best to not do that. <laughs> Be careful with what you do with the titles. The other example, here is where if we search, I can, there are, I think we found something like two and a half thousand examples where people were echoing the issue title and the issue body into the log. So they can say, I'm about to add a label to this issue, documentation to the log, great. Now the reality is, well, what happens if I add my own commands to the issue title and use the, the back tick, as you can see, so that bash executes that command into the echo. So suddenly I have remote code execution inside this particular issue. And let's let's take a look at how that's going to play out. Uh, but first, actually, I should introduce you to the many moving parts that are part of this, uh, this demo. Um, on this side, I have me. This is my normal GitHub. This is the repo that I have made in prep for this a workflow in it. It has a license to read me. It's very big, important repo with lots of code. There's really nothing in it. And then over here, I have my malicious attacker. Currently is an external person because Loud Canadian, as this person's called, is not part of that, is not a collaborator in that repo. Other pieces of this I have are, I have a site here called webhook.site. And that's just waiting for uh, curl commands or API commands to, to reach it. So it's actually, if you've never seen it before, webhook.site is a really handy site for, for things like this or just testing API calls to make sure that your data looks correct. And then the final piece of this is over here, I will be having, a, I, will, I will be waiting for a reverse shell, but we'll get to that a little, little later. So what I want to do now is I'm going to add a workflow. So I want to contribute to this. I'm going to add a file. Now you can already see issues.yaml that it's going to automatically create a fork of this project because I'm not allowed to just commit something directly to this, which is good. You know, that's a that's very solid defaults. So if I paste my issue grooming in here, I'm not actually adding labels. I'm just going to do the echo of the issue title 
and I'm going to suggest that this is something. This is my first contrib contribution. So now I look like a really nice person who's helping and suggesting that, hey, on your site, you might want to do things with issues. Uh, and and that that is it. So I'm going to propose this new file. I'm going to create the pull request because you can see it automatically created. There we go. That's fine. And off we go. And we can see things starting to go. One workflow waiting approval. Great. That's a good thing. So we can come over here to the actual owner. We can see the pull request. And there's our approve and run. And I'm pretty happy with it. I'm going to take a look at the files that changed. I'm becoming a big fan of Loud Canadian because, I'm, oh, look at that. Loud Canadian is such a good person. He's trying to help me make my repo better. I'm going to say approve and run. And we can see there is a workflow here. It's just the default. I've just added the the one that GitHub gives you that prints hello world. So I pre I pre-populated that default workflow. So it runs. It's fantastic. Everyone likes it. I'm confirming the merge. Great. And now if we go look at the code, there's a new issues.yaml. And it's going to trigger when I create an issue. Cool. Well, that's not quite the end. So now that I've made that contribution, I can create an issue. Nice. Well, what's my issue going to be? It's going to look a lot like, and I'm going to cut and paste it because there's no way I'll be able to type this sensibly. There's my backtick, paste, backtick. So this is the first potential thing. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to get all the environment variables. I'm going to a little bit more clever than the one that was submitted to uh, to our own checkout repo, and pipe that to a curl out to my webhook site right there, which is just sitting right there. So let's. Submit that new issue. And then we come over here and hope it actually executes the issue YAML, which it should, if uh, we cross our fingers. We should be able to come over here, click on the actions. And there, there we go. And presto. Just now, 625, I have been far more successful than the attacker on Chekhov. I now have all of the environment variables and poor poor Barack's AWS keys are out in are out sitting in my in my public repo. So I can go from there. Not too bad. Now this is a, a, GitHub, a GitHub hosted runner. So there's nothing really uh, of any damage in there. But you can see though there's an awful lot of information even on a GitHub hosted runner that you might be able to try and find a means with which to leverage. All right, we can move on to the next example. And that was, what do you do? Well, what do you do? We actually covered a lot of this, Brad. Like, what can you do with environment variables? So, I mean, we can double down on, on that. Is there any any extras that you've thought of in the, um, in the interim? Uh, I think that one, changing the logging level and printing more data uh, out that you wouldn't want to print usually, mm. um, like sensitive data, more secrets out there. Um, and uh, we haven't talked about the level of access that GitHub token is giving us, but I guess that we have another slide on it later on. So we'll cover That's it later. True. All right, amazing. So it's 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 a bad it's a, it's an interesting start. So we got some slides. Of how do we how, so how do we protect ourselves from this, Brad? Um, environment variables can actually have a scope, and one of the features that are not used enough in GitHub is the ability to say. A specific environment variable belong only to a specific environment. For example, this secret belongs to production and another secret belongs to dev. Scoping those environment variables is enabling us to have environment protection rules, which are not exactly our back, but there are a set of controls that we can enforce. For example, have a set of users that will approve any usage of that environment variable. So let's say that I have on the next slide, a pipeline. Um, and within that pipeline, I have the requirement to deploy to production website. My website is called github.com. It could have been acme.com or something else. 
who is the allowed practitioner that should approve any change to my production environment or a set of practitioners. If I want two people to have their eyes on the last change, that's fine too. I can create a, an environment protection rule that will say only people, only two people or more are required before setting up a new version of github.com. Let's hit the next one. Another thing that we can do is eliminate the need of putting sensitive data in environment variables and secrets from the first place. GitHub have exposed the ability to use roles and assume roles to have ephemeral access of our self-hosted runners. So let's say that I want to create a deployment to my AWS account. I don't have to use AWS access keys. The thing that I can do is I can use assume role and to, to have temporal access and within AWS, I can limit this level of access, even if it's admin required for deployment, to come only from a specific set of IP addresses. So if I'll configure all of the deployments to come from a trusted IP, that can be a static IP within a trusted subnet, I can enforce zero trust on deployment uh, actions that are happening within my environment. And I will not have any access keys in my environment variables because I'm using ephemeral roles. Um, so that's another option uh, to protect your AWS tokens. And you can utilize okay. AWS tools to make those roles list privilege. Awesome. Hack number two. Hack number two, yeah. Privilege tracking Docker image used in workflow. All right, I'm gonna let you do this one too. All right, let's say that I have an unsecured workflow. Uh, I created that, but it could have been a legit one. It, within my workflow, I'm using a specific image for my job. I'm using a, an image that called GKWS Nginx. It is a legitimate or looking legitimate image that will create a web server within my integration test of my build workflow. But on the next slide, we'll see that actually this Nginx image is poisoned. It can run a vulnerable Docker, download it from Docker Hub. And it might be the case where that specific image has a crypto miner. Meaning on every commit, on every pipeline trigger, um, on the pipeline that I had on the previous slide, it was on every pull request, a crypto, a crypto miner will be executed and communicate with a C2 server just because the image that I'm using is not a legit one. Now, this image used to be existing uh, about a year ago. Docker Hub have removed it from the Docker Hub uh, registry. But let's look on the content that was there. XM rig is a crypto um, miner um, that can be executed. And the entry point within that Docker file was just renaming XM rig into Nginx. So I thought that I'm going to run a web server and a <laughs> Instead of it, I had a crypto miner. Um, and the attacker potentially could have done a lot of money just by submitting pull requests. Um, so one of the, in other words, one of the possible attacks is using bad images as the images of the workers in the different steps in a workflow. So not only you need to check for shell injection and do input sanitization, should also verify what are the images that are being used on every step of the pipeline? And there's a very good reason why we're not doing this one is because we don't want to start running crypto miners on GitHub's um, runners. So we don't want to get in trouble. Um, hack number three. Now I'm going to combine hack three and four. So I will be doing three, but I'm going to do it while I'm showing you four. But the idea here is just to introduce you to the concept of branch protection rules so that approvals require a pull request before merging and what the defaults are associated with that. Because by default, if we go over here, my, my branch protection is off. I have no rules whatsoever. If I come here and I look, I have nothing, which actually opens up an awful lot of freedoms for people who are committing to my repo. So what I will do is I will assign my branch protection to main. And just to be secure, I will say 
require a pull request before merging, and it automatically ticks require approvals. Fantastic. Now, what's interesting about this is that if we are happy with, we could probably do a whole talk just on all of these. But you can see now, allow force pushes is unticked. There's a lot of set, very good sensible defaults here. Um, I'll talk a little bit at the end about requiring signed commits, which a lot of people don't do by default, and it requires a, a certain amount of extra work. But what I've highlighted back here on the slide is the very teeny tiny awkwardly positioned one there. So that means I only need one approval. And OK, sounds good. But at least I'm doing something. The good news is that branch protection rules are great. And occasionally, maybe the, de and the defaults are actually generally pretty good. But that's one interesting default that is there. And that's what we're going to try and get around. So we've done the right thing. We've got our branch protection on there now. I'm going to say create. And we are good to go there. So the theory here is that what if I want to submit a pull request with a new workflow? We talked about doing that, right? And this particular one is just kind of blatantly called approve. And on a pull request, it runs a curl that will actually instruct the GitHub API to approve. Now, this is where we, we're going to talk a little bit about what can the provided GitHub token do. And on its own right now, this would not work because I am not a contributor. I am not a collaborator on this project. I am right now just a casual open source contributor. But because I've been so good and I've been so kind to the repo over the, oh, oh, during, during my social engineering phase, I ask, I can be, well, Canada, geez, only from there. I can be a collaborator. And they say, yeah, you've done, you've done the issue grooming thing and you fixed a readme file. And so now, I, now, now that, that actually changes just enough for this GitHub token to have the credentials to execute that, that API. Now, here's a weird caveat that came up while I was creating this talk. About a month ago, when I created the first repo, though, like the one I've got here, the default settings for this particular, these GitHub actions under general were like this. And in fact, I even have the original repo here, which is set like this. Now, if you create a new repo, the default is that, which is good. Because you can see workflows have read permissions in the repository only you can't do writing you can't write to the repository you can't execute and change approve you can't visit you get actions cannot create pull requests or approve pull requests but if you are if you are a github user go and look at your repos that were created more than a month ago they will all have these settings now which weren't there before but they'll all be like that and so that's there's a little important uh, security tip there if you really care about your repos, maybe go fix that. And so I have set this up intentionally the way it used to be, because that's probably how 99.9999% of all repos still are in GitHub. Um, good. Okay. So, act number four, big finish.
How's that? We can hear you now. All right, all right. I think my microphone just died. I had to switch. Uh, thank you for letting me know, and thank you for uh, in the chat also confirming that uh, it's not just Barack um, losing his hearing. So the, the GitHub token expires when the job finishes, which is a very limited amount of time typically. So it's generated and it's destroyed. It's a, a pretty good, smart default. If we want to look at a little bit more detail, a job can last up to six hours. And actually, it's kind of a long time. I mean, not that we haven't even internally exceeded that and had to break through some of our research, but it means, okay, I've got six hours of life for a single job for that GitHub token to exist. Okay, we know that. And if we want to find out what the default permissions for our workflow token are, this is a table which is from the GitHub documentation. And I always find very confusing because when something says default twice, I don't necessarily know which default I've got. Um, but you can roughly assume that the non-collaborator is the middle and I've just upgraded myself significantly to have a lot more capability with that token by becoming a collaborator. What I also find interesting from the GitHub documentation is that if for some reason the GitHub token isn't doing what you want it to do, so you want to extend the capabilities of the token, their suggestion is to create a personal access token and then add it as a secret. Now, as we've already discussed, if you saw the way that I export, ex, uh, exfiltrated the environment variables, if I could do the same with secrets, then suddenly I would have a potentially significantly persisting GitHub token that doesn't just vanish after six hours. I have a personal access token that might do some real damage. And so here's the, here's the big finish now. This is very small. So I'm going to just zoom in on there. and. and show an example of what I could do if in a workflow. Now, the first one is me echoing all of those secrets. So that token into a file, and then I send that file to myself, just like I did before with the environment variables, out to my malicious web, web, webhook.site. So now, if there is a GitHub token that is potentially significant, or any other secrets at all, I have all of them. And then afterwards, I've done the same thing that I did on the issue grooming is I'm gonna give myself all the environment variables. So I kind of am attempting to get the keys to the kingdom out of this particular, this runner. Now here's an example, I'm just gonna take an aside and something that I found when we were doing the research for this, for this project. Uh, there are actions in the GitHub marketplace, which then do encourage the creation of a personal access token as your GitHub token, because they want to do enhance the capabilities associated with GitHub. Nothing wrong with that. The example I found is there is an organ, there was a particular action that was adding to the capabilities of auto merging pull requests. And in order to do this, and you can see in tiny down letters down there, the first step in these GitHub action was create a personal access token with the right to merge pull requests. Now, as a baddie, I'd love to have that token. That would be fantastic, because not only could I approve, but I could merge. So that's even better. Now, now I'm just bypassing the entire system and adding whatever code I want to the repository. Super duper. So then I went and searched GitHub to find out who uses this auto merge, because uh, then I know that they have a GitHub token that I want because otherwise they wouldn't be using this, this action. It turns out I found an organization, I made that name up, Nodecore, sure. That makes other GitHub actions. And they're using the auto merge on their own GitHub action creation. So I thought, excellent, this is fantastic. If I could do something like create a, submit a workflow that allows me to pull that token out, then I can actually add my own code to those actions. And then I can go find out further on well, who uses the node core actions? Lots of people. Whatever action is the most prolific throughout the industry, I will then add my bad code to that action. And suddenly I'm in one of those bizarre supply chain attacks where I'm adding codes somewhere far back the weak link in the supply chain and people who are using that are now somewhere downstream. And it's a little bit like, like almost like, a, I don't wanna say a solar winds, but I'm, I'm, I'm manipulating something that simply because there was an overprivileged GitHub token that I was able to extract. So this, this is a hypothetical scenario 
that I may have, that does exist in a variety of forms on GitHub. So here's, here's the zoom in on what we were looking at earlier. And then you can see I've added a sleep of an hour. So for some reason I wanted that GitHub token that I just pulled out to exist. And I wanted an hour to poke around with it. Okay, I can submit something that gives me a bit of a delay. Kind of cool. Or in a more targeted and malicious version of this, I could export all of my secrets, all of my environment variables and export a shell or a reverse shell in this case, back to my command and control. And then I'm actually logged in to the runner. So not only do I have all the keys, but I'm actually there and I can start to do the typical pen testing you know, top 10 and look at the network, look at what processes are running, maybe run an nmap and just see what it is I have access to. And if I, as Barack suggested, if I have access to a particular database, I can kind of take my time on this or I can automate what I want to do. So it can be a teeny tiny bit dangerous. So let's take a look if this is possible. It seems like I'm, you know, pie in the sky here. If that, if this is something that I could actually execute, I'm still here. I'm going to go into my workflows again, and I'm now a collaborator. So I'm going to file, and I'm going to paste in that huge thing you just saw called big C I two. And it's rather long, so I'm going to get a lot of code and push it just here. Okay. So on my pull request, I hope this is uh, not too small, but it's going to come in and it's going to approve the pull request for itself and then start to run all of my exfiltration and my reverse shell. Kind of complicated. Nothing to see here. It seems good, and I'm going to call it blatantly pwn.yaml. I'm going to I'm going to submit this, but what I first have to do is I have I'm not waiting for anything, am I? So I'm going to have to do the uh, the receiving side of this. So give me one second to run to execute that. Actually, it might be in my history. Oop. Uh oh. My, my internet has kicked me out. Oh, if that's the only thing that goes wrong, I'll be pretty happy with that. All right. Right. Okay, so now I'm sitting and listening. And once again, it's going to say, yeah, this looks like a perfectly good pull request. You can see the changes are there. It seems happy with it. And I'm creating a pull request again. So you can see a shit. I've only got one thing here. So hopefully if that works, it works. It says there's one review required, but you can see it's actually running my workflow. I don't have to say approve and run. It's actually just going to do it, which is kind of like, Kind of crazy, but that's what that's the entire thing that we're trying to take advantage of. Yeah, while it's running, I will say that GitHub does give us the controls to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. If you are not configuring correctly, it's your responsibility to configure your environment to be secure. Uh, you have the tools to prevent it, but and we're going to demo more tools. But if you haven't done it, you're you're making yourself vulnerable to these scenarios. So either misconfiguration or not hardening your environment can lead to that. But you have the tools provided by GitHub to fix it. Cool, so we can see the build has started. Looks like my approve. Something was gonna go wrong, my approve failed. It was probably something, a permission I missed somehow as my collaborator to auto approve myself, darn. But that's fine. Uh, the rest of it was worked just fine. So you can see up over here now, I have my GitHub token, my environment variables, and a login on the runner. 
Um, even though the approve didn't work, uh, that is actually, I'm pretty happy with that. And things I can do, uh, there's, we talked about many things that I could do. I mean, something that is sort of interesting is I can do a fetch of any other branches that might exist. Um, the branch that was created as part of this, I can go grab, which is loud Canadian patch two. So I can go yeah, check out, oh, if I can spell. Oh, interesting, okay. The thing I was going to do is, is that my branch name? So I'm just going to add a file to this. I'm going to add this to here. And I'm going to see if my if I'm in the right space. I should be able to see if that is there. Okay, that's the that's the evidence, let's say. What if I were to remove that? I don't want that there. Get uh, and removal of that. And this is one that you showed me, Barack, which I thought was fascinating, is the ability to just set my name to be whatever, whoever I want. And then I can commit those changes back to the branch that is existing as part of the workflow, which is kind of strange. Uh, and this is the part that I hope works because it's just a, uh, for some reason, my branching was being a bit strange there. Oops. And this is where I wanted to commit back to. There's a lot of, there's a lot of risk going on here. Did I spell the, uh, the branch wrong? I don't know, Barack, if you, uh, remember what my branch was called. I thought it was patch two. It was just called patch two. Was oh, that what I got wrong? Apologies. This is where we're going to have running out of time, isn't it? This is the first time we've run this. I didn't know how long it was going to be. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, can you run git fetch before that? Darn, it's blowing up on me, isn't it? And we are running out of time. Darn. So I'm the thing exit. that we could have done is uh, to delete all the trails of the actual attack that just happened uh, from within the server by creating another commit, hiding all of those changes. So that, and that is exactly what these steps do. Yeah, that when they work. If the branches, if I if we get, don't rush it and the branch works, you can do that. You can delete the pwn, you can add a file, you can add it as somebody else. And when you come back over here, if you can use your imagination, the pull request contents of, will, will change away from being the workflow content and now will just be an instant readme. That's what that was supposed to be the big finish. This would have been gone and there would have been something very innocent there. So we would have had a reverse shell, we would have covered our tracks. And now that we only have eight minutes left, I'm out of time to actually redo this again, which is very disappointing. But it will leave you in suspense. Next time I have to do this talk, it will probably work better. And I should always record the, my, my live demos just in case they blow up. But the best practices we are meant to learn from this, and I'll put them down here quickly in the interest of time. Uh, and we've seen all of them. Turning on bash, branch protection, not adding permissive GitHub tokens, using a short lifespan personal access token. If you do go that route uh, and give that token as little privilege as, you, as it needs, don't run workflows unless you're 100% sure. Be careful when you're adding contributors because it could be a social engineering kind of exercise. 
and use the environments protection as Brack told us all about the scope secrets to environments. And of course, finally, single sign-on, multi-factor, sign commit, all of the things that we say we're gonna do, we never get around to. Those are all great advices. And finally, scanning all of your reference container images. Um, the final thing we want to add outside of best practices is that our open source tool that we did all the research for is called Checkoff. And Checkoff is the most, most let's say most revised, most comprehensive misconfiguration scanner for infrastructure as code, uh, version control systems, NCI pipeline as code, just like what we just saw. And it looks for checks from GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket, more frameworks to come soon. And the other, all oh, my windows have rearranged. An example of that being, for example, if I was to run Chekhov as simple as this on the example files that I've got here, like tell me a secret.yaml, we can see that it runs a series looking for curls with secrets, looking for netcasts, looking for IP addresses. And of course, in this one, it found that I was trying to curl out all of my secrets. And Chekhov, you can get for free. Chekhov is here, is at Chekhov.io, where you can learn more about it and start using it immediately. And it has integrations with VS Code and JetBrains IDEs, and it does all sorts of wonderful things in terms of infrastructure as codes. So that is our takeaway. And oh, finally, you can add as a GitHub action. And that can be pretty critical because can you run it as your first GitHub action to make sure that the workflows that you're about to approve and run aren't going to be the thing that's malicious? Probably a good idea, I would think because you can find that all of, the, all of the things that I did today are preventable by a checkoff and best practices, particularly when they work. Uh, we only have five minutes left. So the takeaway is secure design uh, takes work, unfortunately. Open source tools are there to help. Misconfigurations are first class problems. Defaults, as usual, are not secure. And pipeline as code security can and should be applied at all phases throughout the CI. All of this can be done very, very easily and with the help of additional automation. That is the end, and I'm sorry that big finish didn't work. That's so frustrating. All right, thank you everyone. If you have any questions, now it's a good time to put them on chat. Thank y'all. Yes, any questions, pop them in the chat and we will get to them with the five minutes we have left. <laughs> Hopefully Very it was good so timing, good. by the way. Ugh. It was the first time we did that one. Sorry. Obviously, because it didn't 100% work, but we did a lot of damage by getting the reverse shell and <laughs> exfiltrating all of the content. So it was good. Well, Y'all did great. Does anyone have questions? Going once. All right. Well, Stephen Barak, thank y'all so much. Um, I know you're at a conference. So thank you very much for taking the time. And um, I hope everyone at your booth enjoyed this too. And Excellent. we will see y'all next time. And thank you everyone for joining us for a CNCF live webinar. Please remember next week, we will not have any online programs due to KubeCon Cloud Native Con Europe. And hopefully we will see you all there. We'll see y'all next time. Thank you. Bye.